going on? This is the Kevin Dwayne Podcast, as always. Thank you so much for showing up and listening to the show. Something I have never done on the show is read some of the nice things you guys have said on the podcast page on Apple. So I'm going to do that today, starting today. So if you guys continue to leave your five star ratings or four stars, if you really want to you know, be constructive in your reviews, I'm going to start reading them on the show just to support that behavior. But the first one is from Jay Rugg and it says, quote, your reset of your podcast is fantastic. I love your honesty and blatant delivery. Oh, I'm still a hopeless romantic as well. The Pisces nature. (laughs) I love that. Thank you so much. Another one is from Arcona. It says, Mr. Dwayne's commentary on the issues of today is full of thought provoking insight, honesty, and even a bit of humor. I'm not sure how he does it, to be honest. As a fellow podcaster, I've struggled to figure out how to stay so interesting and insightful when on my own. Yet, Mr. Dwayne, I love that you call me Mr. Dwayne, (laughs) does it with seeming ease. His latest episode does an excellent job of drawing connections to his own experiences. This is a must-listen show. Get it in your ear holes. Yes, ear holes. And there's another one that says, I love Kevin's humor and wisdom. He also keeps it 102. Thank you. Texas Sigma 01. Those are very nice things. I really appreciate it. As I said, I love that I'm able to connect with you all by being authentic to myself, which leads into today's episode. You probably saw the title and like, what is he going to talk about this week? It's called Lying and Daydreaming. As you all know, I've been digging into my past and I'm working through therapy and childhood stuff to kind of really get a hold on who I am today. So let's dig in. Somewhere in my childhood, I learned that I had to perform to receive love, whether it was being the well-mannered little boy in public or doing extremely well in school. I was taught a unhealthy selflessness in the process, you know, being so young and desperate for validation of my parents. I feel as though I got lost in an image. When it came down to my preferences like toys, my favorite colors, entertainment, and dreams that I shared out loud, it seems that they were all ran through a filter of what was acceptable to the image that my parents wanted to achieve for me or unacceptable. When I talk about like color, for example, I have this memory and it's going to sound crazy, I know, but I'm trying to be truthful. I'm trying to be real. I grew up in South Central, early 90s, so lots of gang violence. So you can almost get into the perspective of my aunt who was raising me. I remember being asked what my favorite color was. I stated that I liked the color red. I was actually scolded for liking the color red. And she was just like, no, you can't like the color red. You can like green. Green is going to be your favorite color. I was literally gaslit into t- <laughs> to believing that I liked green. And I spent the next, what, 10, 15 years of my life receiving green stuff that I actually didn't even like, but I was convinced that I liked it. And I always think about this green jacket I had in middle school. It was a green fubu jacket. If I find the picture, I'm going to post it as a throwback Thursday. But it's a green, it's like a green and blue jacket. And it was actually quite hideous. It was so hideous, but I had the green jacket with the green fubu shirt and I had these bright green shoes and I kind of just owned it. But truthfully, I don't even like green like that. I actually like red. I like brown. I like earth colors. I like these things. But as a kid, I started learning that everything that I had preference for had to be approved by my parents. So that pushed me into a level of people pleasing. Honestly, not even a level. It pushed me into people pleasing. There was no such thing as personal boundaries or even a self-identity. It was very much comply or be disciplined. So I chose to comply. I mean, I had no kind of backbone. Where was I going to get it from? If someone wasn't teaching me to stand my ground, why would I stand it? I just wanted to please people so I can get validation and be loved for whatever I was performing, whatever I was doing. So because my reality was so curated, I relied on my imagination very heavy. 
I would spend hours daydreaming, listening to music, dancing, recreating videos in my head while practicing in the mirror. It was the one time that I had space to be authentically me. I locked my door, which I'm surprised I was allowed to do, but I locked my door and whatever flow for me was performed in private and it felt like freedom. And I look back and realize it's because I really didn't have it. I was so busy trying to be pleasing to everyone around me. And because I was always criticized and spoken to in a certain way, I became afraid to speak my actual truth and my actual desires. It was all about what everybody else wanted from me. So during the day growing up in the presence of others, I was a respectable young man with priorities in order. But in private, I was free will. I was a free willed wild child who was free to express himself in any way possible. I've continued various aspects of this ideal my entire life, well into my adulthood. I mean, well into the present time because I had no awareness of it. The issue is I got lost behind the mask and started believing that that was who I was. I was the image that my parents curated and constructed for me. This has caused me so many problems because I've been trained to take in the comfort and approval of people, even when it comes at a detriment to me. Even when I am uncomfortable, even when I am filled with anxiety, I was taught to please people versus myself. So what began as a personal form of survival has essentially made me a liar. I have been a liar for my entire life. Now, I know that word triggers people because the concept of lying is controversial. The word liar can actually bring on visceral reactions among many. This is because we equate lying with causing pain and betrayal. But lying is something everyone does in some aspect in their life. There is no one on earth who hasn't told some kind of lie, whether big or small. For example, you say you're five five minutes away from your friend's house when you know you haven't even put your shoes on yet at your own place. But then there's big lies like telling a whole nation of people that COVID-19 is no big deal or even that it's a hoax. But the thing is, we all lie. If you look up the definition of a liar, it's a noun. And the definition is a person who tells lies. Similar words are deceiver, fibber, falsifier. Teller of lies, teller of untruths, perjurer, false witness, fabricator, equivocator, romancer. Now, the dreamy Pisces in me likes that one. I like romancer. I have romanced things my entire life, but I've been a liar. And I don't want to be afraid of that word. That word has always done something to my core. But I think it's because it's true. I've lied. What's funny is, in July of 2018, Yolo Akili, who's been on the show, he is the founder of Beam, which is a phenomenal mental health platform. You must check it out if you haven't already. He tweeted the following, quote, The thing is many Black gay men learn to lie so early, to hide self, manipulate the truth, or survival. Many don't unlearn those strategies and they spill out into every part of our lives. We become adults still hiding, lying, and relying on coping strategies that are killing us. End quote. When I first read this, I was among the group of men who were triggered. I felt like it was an attack. I was like, how could he tweet this shit? Like, that's some bullshit. So I dismissed it, kept on scrolling. But today, I've reconciled that it hit me at my core because it was true. I was one of the people he was speaking of. And it's funny because when I was putting together 
this week's show, I reached out to him for that quote. I said, hey, a while ago you posted this. He's like, oh, I remember. I think it was on Twitter, but I'm not sure. And so we were actually searching for it together. And so I was able to find it and I sent it back to him and I let him know. I'm like, I'm going to use this on my next show because I identify with it. And we had a talk about it as well. And I was explaining to him how I came to the understanding that I had been using lying as a coping strategy and it was killing me. And we talked about that and it was a great conversation. I hope you're listening, YOLO. I told you I would use it. But I've been lying to myself and thus lying to everyone around me as a coping strategy to get through life. It began as a child when telling my truth came with harsh criticisms and scolding because it wasn't pleasing to everyone else. At a certain point, I cultivated a skill of studying people and their tastes and predicting what they wanted for me. But this made my reality very unpleasant because I was always on the sacrificing end of interpersonal relationships. Always. It's like I didn't have my own identity. And next thing you know, I'm an adult and I'm doing the same things, but it doesn't look as good when you're an adult doing it because now you're just a liar. And people are like, well, why are you lying for no reason? It wasn't for no reason. It's because of my upbringing. It's because of what I had to do to get by, to feel loved, to feel validated is not to intentionally hurt anybody, even though I have hurt people because of my lying. So daydreaming and fantasy thinking provided me a much needed relief from the reality. And I began to rely heavily on that because I couldn't get what I wanted in the real world. In reality, I was always thinking about the future or thinking about the past or in my head being somewhere else and not in the present because the present just wasn't comfortable. And I didn't notice the present wasn't comfortable. I mean, until recently, but I look back on when I was in college. I actually was very depressed in college. And fantasy thinking and daydreaming is what got me through that. So Oxford Reference describes fantasy thinking as a form of thinking based on fantasy that relies on imagery, emotion, and intuition without logical or moral constraints. That's a big part. Without logical or or moral constraints. That's me all day. I would get so caught up in fantasy that Nothing made sense in in the real world. I would make my decisions based on that. And it's just, it's terrible. So as a domino effect of childhood, my adult life, my goals, my mental health, everything crumbled from me not being present for them, especially when critical action was needed. You see, when you're living in a fantasy, you aren't seeing things for what they are. You most certainly aren't making realistic decisions. I know I wasn't. So as I stated, I actually was depressed in college. I didn't know what to call it. It wasn't until I got an idea of like definitions and understood therapy and understood mental health that I was like, oh, that's what that was. I thought I was just being an adult, but I was actually very depressed in college and I didn't know why, but it was because I simply wasn't happy. I didn't like what I was doing. So I spent a lot of time daydreaming. I would sit in classes and just daydream, dreaming of being a celebrity, being madly in love with the man of my dreams, with the world gasping at our great romance. Because at the end of the day, what did I want? I wanted to be validated. I wanted to be loved unconditionally. So that's obviously what I was daydreaming of. And it's funny that I would daydream about being a celebrity because I didn't want to be a businessman. I didn't want to be in college studying marketing. So it affected my reality. The truth is, it makes sense that it happened when I was in college because that's the one time that I started getting freedom over my own life. See, in high school, my parents had a firm hand on me. So they saw all my grades, progress reports. Like, I couldn't get less than a B. B, even. B minus always got me in trouble. and. 
I grew into that. But when I got to college, I had a little bit more freedom, but I didn't have a backbone and I didn't have the ability to set boundaries, even with my parents. You see, I hated college so much because number one, I didn't want to go to the school that I went to. I actually wanted to go to San Diego State or Long Beach State. I got accepted to both of them. But my aunt was like, no, the money, the tuition is too much for those schools. The school that we have you in, the, the, the tuition is just right. You won't be paying too much and it's near home so you can be close to close to home. And then I had no way of like really standing up to her because once again, I was trained to please and comply. I had no way of saying I don't want to go to the school. Not only that, I couldn't even choose the majors that I wanted. I wanted to go into theater. I wanted to go into music, maybe even broadcast journalism. But because that wasn't acceptable to my aunt and uncle, I didn't do it. I had to get a degree that made sense to them. So I was miserable at a school I didn't like. Do you know, in the time that I was at that school, I never seen the inside of the gym. I never went to one event on campus. I didn't do anything that was related to school in the entire time I was there because I just didn't like it. I didn't care. I was upset. And while I was daydreaming about a life I wanted to have, I had a GPA that was less than 2.5 at best because I just, I didn't care. I didn't want to be there. You know, and then I was in crippling debt already because what's so funny about this is I was told I couldn't go to the schools that I wanted to go to because of the tuition, but I ended up paying for it all because when I signed the paperwork, I signed the student loans. I signed off to get the grants. I worked to pay for my books when I needed to. So it's so crazy that I was told by people what I could and could not do when I was the one paying for it. And I look back like, man, if I could just go back and just stand up for myself, I would be in a different situation. But you know what? Everything happens for a reason. And I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now if anything changed back then. But I just had, I had no boundaries for anything. I just did what people wanted of me. And it really took me to a low place that I didn't understand when I was going through it. So yeah, I was depressed. I was in crippling debt already because I didn't understand finances. So I was just spending money and blowing up my credit cards. All of this to try to buy happiness. I was just trying to find some kind of validating principle to just make me feel like I was being seen and also loved unconditionally. My love life has been trash. I mean, I say was, but I mean, up until recently, because I wasn't aware, I was codependent, as I talked about last week. I had an anxious attachment style. I ignored red flags. I wasn't honest about my true desires, needs, and expectations from potential partners because I didn't know how to say what I wanted. I always thought that what I wanted was always wrong. And I had to conform to whoever was in front of me. And it just, it always led to toxic ass relationships. Romanticizing toxic behaviors is one of my favorite pastimes. This is because I was taught to worship image over healthy connections. Also, once again, no boundaries. So I was constantly manipulated, gaslit, and abandoned. My fantasy for the perfect romance kept me in a dangerous cycle. I was lying to myself and I started believing the whole fabrication of it all. I started believing that's just who I was. And I was just this docile, easygoing guy who's always happy, who rolls with the punches. And one day I'm going to get what I need. But the truth of the matter is I didn't actually truly know myself, love myself, or respect myself because those things were not taught to me. I was taught to people please, lie, and yeah, crazy. But awareness is key. Awareness is key. Now that I've confronted my lies and my outward image, I'm focused on authenticity. I'm okay with people seeing me angry, bitter, sad, or even rude. I'm okay if I make public mistakes or even disappoint people because it's my right as a human. 
I've wasted so much life living for others and I take full responsibility from this point forward. You know what's crazy about authenticity and living in your truth? It removes triggers and sensitivity. When I started being true to myself and sharing that truth with others, I was no longer guarded. Long time ago, I mean, hell, even last year, I couldn't even take criticism or negative feedback because there was truth in it. And that meant whoever was providing the commentary saw beneath my mask into the darkness of my core. And I tried my hardest to conceal that. But now that I'm being truthful and real, I have nothing to hide. So feedback just rolls off. I'm no longer people pleasing. I'm no longer concerned about perception. I'm concerned about how I view me. I'm concerned about loving me. I'm concerned about self-respect. I'm concerned about my goals. I'm actually in the core of myself now. So here I am. I'm not indebted to the opinions and pleasures of others. My core has been set free. And I'm now living honestly in the present moment. I'm not daydreaming. I'm not wishing I was somewhere else. Life is beautiful. There's no longer a reason to dream of being anywhere but here right now. But yes, I have been a liar and I've been a frequent daydreamer. But not anymore. I'm now here. I'm now present. And I hope that you can take some of this and apply it to your life if it applies. But uh, let me know your thoughts, your feedback. Hit me up on IG or email me at Kevin Dwayne podcast at gmail.com. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving. I'll talk to you all next time. Peace out.